Number one, I'm glad you're still here. Because if you weren't, then I would probably just have to leave. But you're still here. And we've had a great day. And thankful for, for all the people that have visited, folks that have come uh, from other congregations for this 1.30 service, for the invitation. I know also that I'm now going to have David travel around and talk before I get up because uh, he really says nice things, and I need people to say nice things. Yeah. You know, I would say something about, you know, I mentioned this morning that I had invited the lady at the front desk to come to the gospel meeting, and uh, I, you know, it's easy to forget about those things and kind of get bogged down even in just preaching to the members or doing the work of the church, and if you get into a large congregation like we are, there are things to keep me busy all the time, so to be evangelistic, you have to decide to be evangelistic, and you have to think about opportunities. And uh, recently, I was feeling guilty, David. I was feeling guilty because we had hired this new group to come and clean our building. It's not cleaned by the members right now. It's being cleaned by a service. And they had been there for several weeks coming in, cleaning my office. You know, they'd vacuum the floors and do all the other things that they do. And I had not offered them, you know, an invitation to our services. So I stopped them a couple of Mondays ago and I said, you have come in here and you clean the building that we worship in and you haven't even had an invitation yet to services. So I, I think you have to think about those things. They have to be constantly on your mind. If you do things like that, you may be unsuccessful. You may be unsuccessful with, with getting someone to worship or getting someone into a Bible study, but this is all for free. This is not even a part of my lesson, but this is important, so I want to talk about it. A couple of examples. I will admit that sometimes I go, well, often I go to McDonald's and to Hardee's. Okay? I go there for breakfast. You know, on my way to, uh, to worship, I mean, on my way to work, and I'm dropping my kids off or, or something like that. And I started having conversations with people in the drive through window, one at the Hardee's and one at the McDonald's, and I would alternate those. And one day, one day I'm out and about, and I see that this guy that's at the McDonald's window is dating the girl that had been at the Hardy's window. And I thought, well, you know me and I know you, but I didn't know you were together. And we started having conversations. They eventually came and visited with us. Um, they had come from Chattanooga to go to school at Tech. They didn't have a church home, but I eventually baptized them and they got married there and they're a big functional part of our church but they were just my drive through people. So you just never know. And, I, and this is an, another true thing. There's a girl that uh, became a Christian because I hit her with my car. But I didn't hit her, I hit her car with my car. I wanna go ahead and clarify that. And this happened in the, in the car line, picking up my daughter from school. I backed into her car, I didn't see it. And uh, we were, you know how the car line is at school. It's the craziest place you could ever go. And um, for, for trying to get places. And I said I was sorry, and I gave her my insurance card, and I said, I'm a preacher. You can count on me, but I'm leaving the country for two weeks starting tomorrow. <laughs> and that was actually true. I was going on a mission trip to New Zealand. But through Facebook, we started talking, and then we ended up in a Bible study, and she became a Christian. So you just never know. You do have to look for opportunities. Uh, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, now here's my task. My task is to keep you awake after the meal. So this has to be interesting, right? We're going to talk about heaven, and I can't think of anything that's more interesting to talk about or more engaging than talking about where we're going to be someday, our true home, homecoming. Uh, so turn over to the book of Revelation in chapter 21, and I think about Adam and Eve being cast out of the Garden of Eden from the presence of God and these are the only two people that have ever lived on the earth that knew what it was like to be in paradise. I can only imagine what that would have been like for them to have to think about what they had lost. I mean, they were in the presence of God. They did not know sin. It was a perfect world that God had created for them. And the fellowship with God that they had gone forever. I can imagine that they had questions. They had fears. These things went through their minds wondering if they could ever get that back. You know, Job asked the question in Job 14 and verse 14, if a man dies, shall he live again? 
Now, note that Job was one of the most faithful people that ever lived in the Bible, and yet he asked the question about eternity. He wanted to know for sure that there was something beyond the grave. In Revelation chapter 21, what we have, of course, is a picture of heaven. And I think about John on the island of Patmos being exiled there for preaching the gospel. And, of course, this revelation comes to him. And we see the words of Christ early on in the book of Revelation, speaking to the churches of Asia through John. And then we have this message that is to encourage the church of the first century that was going through great persecution. But I think about the fact that maybe God blessed John with this revelation for his encouragement, not just for the church, but that he could just see a glimpse of heaven. You think also of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 as he was dealing with this thorn in the flesh. It also says in the midst of all this, that he was caught up into the third heaven. And he saw in paradise, or heard in paradise, he said in verse 4, inexpressible words, which it is not possible for a man to utter. And I begin to think about what John saw and what Paul might have seen, just to have a glimpse of heaven. And it makes me think of what was discussed with Marco Polo, the great explorer, before he died. He was the great Venetian traveler of the 13th century, and as he was dying, he was urged by his foes, his detractors, to recant about all of his travels and all of the things that he supposedly was able to discover. And, and to that, his reply was simply this, I have not told half of what I saw. I've not told half of what I saw. Whatever John saw in the book of Revelation, whatever Paul saw when he was caught up into the third heaven, I don't think it's possible that they could use human words to describe that paradise that we call heaven. And I will be honest with you that over the years in preaching, there are two things that I think the preacher cannot really preach in a way that is fair. There's just something the preacher cannot do. The preacher cannot describe the love of God with human words. And the preacher cannot in any way express to the hearer how great heaven is going to be. See, these things are beyond this place that we are bound by. And I have to admit that when we were singing that song this afternoon, it was a perfect song. I don't know about tomorrow. But, and there are things I don't understand. But, you know, we understand who is holding our hand through all of that, and that is God. We believe through the eye of faith that there is a place called heaven. So look here in Revelation chapter 21 where he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the former heaven and the former earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We have this picture of the new Jerusalem. And I want to also express to you, as we talk about heaven today, that I think that the only possible way for us to even comprehend it is that God would take something that is spiritual and that is eternal, and he would, I guess, pardon the expression, dumb it down for us into human thoughts and ideas. For example, I don't believe that there are streets of gold literally. I don't believe that there are pearly gates. I don't believe that we are talking about a physical place. If you understand who God is, on some level, and let's, 
this face that we can't even really comprehend God. But if we can understand on some level that he is a spiritual being, remember what he said through Paul in Acts chapter 17, that God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He's a spiritual being, so how would we think that heaven is a physical place? John's just getting this description for us so we can understand the purity of it, the, the magnificence of it, the beauty of it, the holiness of it, the hope and the, and the love and the joy and the peace that comes by being in the presence of God. And I've been trying to wrap my head around heaven ever since I first heard about what it really was. And I still have to say that at the end of this sermon, I'm probably going to be confused on some level as to what it's going to be. But what I want to do is comfort you and, and get you to trust that God is preparing for us a place that is beyond our imagination, that is better than anything that we can know in this world. And that is our hope, and that is our joy. And because of that, we have so much to look forward to. Well, I think one important aspect about heaven, since we're talking about a homecoming, is we need to be constantly talking about heaven and thinking about heaven. If we don't focus on the ultimate goal, then we're going to be sidetracked in things that are not as important. There's a, a doctor from Cornell University who observed that from the moment people decide to concentrate on and put all their energies on one specific object, an objective, they begin to surmount the most difficult odds. He said the establishment of a goal is the key to successful life. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you have to be a goal-oriented person? How are you going to accomplish at work what you need to do at work unless you understand there's a task at hand and there's a deadline in order to get that done? How are you going to get through school unless you're looking for a degree? Or how are you going to get to anything done around the house or in relationships or in your own personal life unless you go ahead and put it on a schedule, stick it in front of you, and take a look at that on a regular basis? Now, one of the reasons why I actually got into running is because I can measure my success. I can finish something. I can see the, the end result of what I'm doing, and every single time I cross the finish line, there's some feeling of accomplishment in that, and there's joy in that. But it doesn't matter any kind of human race or any kind of human objective we have. It's really not very important when we think in terms of heaven. See, I think about my son graduating high school yesterday, and that's on my mind, of course, because I'm getting ready to send him out into the world now. And uh, I didn't, I don't know where the time went. I turned around and he was grown, and now he's ready to, to leave our home. And I don't know about you as parents, but I kind of think, well, I would like another shot at that. I still got two more at the house, so maybe, maybe I can concentrate some more on those things. But reality is hitting with me now. But I, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how much money he makes. I don't care what kind of car he drives. All I care about is his relationship with God. And I think that our job is to raise our children for eternity. We don't raise them for here. We raise them for there. And if they can be strong Christians, then we're going to be successful. We need to let them know that their ultimate objective in life has to be the afterlife. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. In a few minutes, I'm going to talk about some things that people don't understand about heaven. But one of the concepts that to me blows my mind is that people would like to defer Christ's coming. They would like to say, well, I want Jesus to come back and take us to heaven, but, you know, I'd like for him to wait a little while. Why? Why? Well, see my kids raised, see my grandkids raised. You're, you're looking on two different planes here. You're not even in the same, I mean, if we get to see those things, fine. But nothing's going to compare to heaven. This earthly life is not what it's about. So I have a hard time conceptualizing that. It's kind of like the preacher that had everybody raise their hand. You know, I haven't done this practice in a long time. And I'm not going to make you do it today, but I've done it before. Like, raise your hand if, and you know, get everybody to raise their hand. And if you say something like this, raise your hand if you want to go to heaven. I mean, what do you think the, the participation of the church is going to be? Probably 100%, right? So raise your hand if you want to go to heaven. Well, everybody raise their hand except one guy up in the front row. R raise it up high, raise it up high. And, and everyone put their hands down when he was at, done asking the question. He said, 
sir, don't you want to go to heaven? He goes, sure, I want to go to heaven, but I thought you were taking up a bus right now. You know, he, he didn't want to go at this particular moment because he had too many things to do while he was here. And I think when we look at Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, you remember that passage where it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt, where thieves do not break, up, break in and steal, because where your treasure is, what? There your heart will be also, yeah. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he, Proverbs 23, 7. So we understand that to think about heaven and to desire heaven and even to believe in heaven. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. You know, this is the chapter of faith, and it's a great chapter. I have about 30 sermons on this chapter that are all different because there's so much in there. And in, in verses 13 through 16, he talks about these people who died in faith, who didn't get to have the promises come to them. Later on in the chapter, he says they weren't going to receive those promises apart from us because we're also in, the ones who inherit that promise in the New Testament age. But it says that they consider themselves to be strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The people of Hebrews chapter 11 are the people that first sang, This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. You know, that's an old song that's been sung for thousands of years in different ways. And it even says that they desire a homeland. And when they talked about going home, since we're talking about homecoming, it says they weren't talking about that home that they grew up in. They weren't talking about that place that they, they remembered was the old home place. They were talking about heaven. And it says, for those people... God is not ashamed to be called their God because he has prepared a city for them. But look back in verses 8 through 10 where it talks about Abraham. And I want to get this concept out about heaven just for a moment. Do you believe that heaven is a real place? Do you believe that it's a real place? Or is it just some pipe dream or something that makes people feel better? I'm asking this question honestly because what happens in life as you grow up is Heaven and hell, and even the idea of what lies beyond the grave is only a concept. It's an only I an idea for you. You're raised on it. You believe in it. You, you see it. You think about it. But something will happen. This is what will happen. Someone very close to you will die. And when they die, the first, do you remember the first time someone who was close to you died? And you were separated from that person, and you went up to their body, and you knew that it was no longer animated. That as the Bible says, the body returns to the earth as it was, but the spirit to God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. You knew that that person that you have always known was no longer here. And what do you ask yourself? Where did they go? Where did they go? It's in that moment where you say to yourself, do I really believe in heaven? Do I really believe, if you want to become specific about it, in heaven? the Hadean realm, okay? Because we know that if we read Luke chapter 16, that when a person dies, they go into this waiting place and they go into paradise. What did Jesus say in Luke chapter 23? Today, surely I said you'll, you'll be with me in paradise. You know, when the close people in my life who are members of the church died, I believe, this is comforting to me, I believe that they went where my Savior had gone. And if my Savior went there when he died, that's good enough for me that my family member went there when they died. Knowing that one day when Jesus comes again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. But Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, look what it says. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place that he would receive in his inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. This is what I'm trying to tell you. We are called to a place when it speaks of heaven and we don't know where we're going. We've never been there before. And that's why I can't preach to you specifically and tell you this is exactly what heaven's going to be like. I only have what the Bible tells me, and it's limited, but it tells me enough for me to know that that's where I want to go. In fact, it tells me enough that I want to go right now. You know, there are some people that not only disbelieve in the idea of heaven, they even malign it. Have you ever heard people say stuff like this? And this, again, this blows my mind. Well, are we just going to get up there and be singing the whole time? 
That sounds boring to me. It sounds like everyone just kind of stands around and sings. I don't even like to sing. The person doesn't understand the concept of heaven. Some call it dreaming, illusory, and harmful. Here's what the Human Manifesto says. No surprise there, because that's all about today and now. This is what the Humanist, Humanist Manifesto says. Promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusory and harmful. They distract humans from present-day concerns. Now, here's my reply to that. I would say they deliver humans from present-day concerns because present-day concerns are not all what they're cracked up to be. This world is not perfect. If it were, then we wouldn't have a place called heaven to look forward to. Some call heaven a distraction from reality. They, they treat the Bible as if it's some type of fairy tale or some type of story. Here's what I, I like as far as a response to that type of idea. C.S. Lewis wrote this in Mere Christianity. He said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I have a lot of things in the world that are satisfactory to me, a lot of things that are enjoyable, but there's a hole that I think only God can fill. There are hopes that I have that I think only heaven can make real. And I think that's the way that God made us so that we could seek that homeland and seek that place. So let's talk a few minutes about things we don't understand about heaven. I heard this illustration of about a guy that uh, he wanted to take something with him. And all you have to do is read 1 Timothy chapter 6, where Paul says in talking to Timothy about not being materialistic, we brought nothing in this world, and it's certain that what? We're not going to take anything out. So having food and clothing and you know, the necessities of life, he says, herein we should be content. Godliness with contentment is great gain, but those who desire to be rich fall into a snare. And he goes on to talk about the idea of the love of money being the root of all types of evil. But there was a man who decided that he wanted to take some possessions with him into heaven. And, of course, this is a fictitious story, but it was finally allowed by one of the angels, okay, you can take whatever you want, but just one thing, into heaven with you. So here he comes, and he's got a bar of gold. And the angel says, you brought pavement? I mean, the idea is simply this. What we see as valuable does live in the physical realm. Our thinking is limited, and that's why I had this verse read to kind of get us in the, in the idea of what we're going to talk about here. I don't think like you think, God says. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So in order for us to even get into our mind the concept of what heaven is, we have to go outside of the box. But here's some questions that people have asked about heaven, people that don't understand things about heaven. Will we know everything or get an answer to all of our questions when we get to heaven? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever had been in a conversation with somebody about a question that you can't answer and you say, well, when I get to heaven, that's one of the first things I want to ask. I think when we get to heaven, we won't care anymore. <laughs> I just don't think we'll care anymore. In fact, I think about the people that I have loved, love me, that are now beyond this world. In fact, this weekend was hard for me because my father was not there to see my son graduate. And I would give anything for my dad to see what a good young man he has become. But my, on the other side, I realized my dad does not care about those things where he is. He's free from the things in this world that bind us to it. So I don't know, but I will, as far as our questions being answered, but I'm going to give you these two verses. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We don't even know exactly what we're going to look like, what kind of body we're going to have. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says it's a, a glorious body, and it's a body that will never get tired, never get worn out. It's going to be given to our spirit, but it's going to be able to live in heaven forever. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12 says that now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. 
So again, I think there is going to be an opportunity to see things that we've never seen, to know things that we've never known. But how much of that, I can't tell you. I know that God knows all things. He's omniscient. And it says that we'll know more. But it doesn't say what that's going to be. Here's another question. Will we learn anything new in heaven? Will we be exposed to anything new? Um, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, we already read that, where, where God says, Behold, in talking about heaven, I make all things new. Now, that gives me the idea that everything that we've ever known in the world, in a sense, is going to be evaporated, and we're going to be looking at new things, because people are afraid that there are not going to be things to do in heaven. All I can say is if God can give us this many things to do in six days, what can he give us as far as what's going to happen on the other side over these thousands of years he's been preparing this place for us? I'm just going to tell you right now as I'm trying to teach this and preach this, I'm struggling in trying to get this across because it's so beyond my own imagination to comprehend it. Ephesians chapter 2, here's another passage that I love. It tells us, uh, starting in verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up together. Now listen to this part. And made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God is going to show us more about grace when we get to heaven. I don't even understand exactly what that means, but I do think that part of being in heaven is knowing that you arrived on the other side safely. And what I mean by that is, here we are. You're, you're a Christian, hopefully. I'm a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you need to make that decision today. Don't let it be another minute before you make that decision, because we can't even talk about heaven if you're not a Christian. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. We have to be in Christ or else there are no promises. There is no hope. But right now, our salvation, in a sense, is theoretical. I believe with all of my heart that if I died today, I would go to heaven when Jesus comes again. Why? Because of, because of the grace of God and because I've been obedient to the gospel. I can read in the Bible the plan of salvation. I've obeyed that. And I know that I sin daily, but I also know that as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us of every sin, First John chapter 1 and verse 7. So if I'm doing the very best that I can to live according to the law of God, even when I am human, if I continue to ask God daily for forgiveness, if I continue to have a repentant heart, I believe that the power of his grace is going to save me eternally. So I don't have any doubts about where I'm going from this place. Not because of what I have done, but because of what he has done. If we we're going to base it on human performance, we would all feel like that we do not belong in heaven with God because we have not always lived up according to his law. And as confident as I am about my salvation, I'm still not there yet. And so all I can say is this. When we are in heaven... The reason why we were going to sing the song of the Lamb by and by is because we will understand what his grace has brought us to. We only think of it as what it can be, but we will see it as it is. Here's another interesting thing that I've thought about about my kids. I was one of those people growing up that I liked safe. I liked security. I liked to be okay. And I would even admit that when I made the decision to obey the gospel, that a big part of that was because I was trying to be safe. I didn't want to go to hell. How many of you had that as a part of what was in your mind? I don't want to go to hell. And that's a good thing to be thinking about because we need to realize that hell is a real place. You don't even hear about it being preached anymore. But it's a real place. And just as much as heaven is heaven, hell is hell. And it's going to be terrible. You're going to be away from the presence of God and from the glory of his power. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. So here I am and I'm trying to be secure. And I'm making the decision because I love God, because I know what Jesus did for me, because I feel bad that I put him on the cross, but also I'm trying to avoid the disaster that is hell, and I'm also wanting to be rewarded with heaven. And I, I said, I'm gonna, I remember being in my bed as a teenager, and I made up this little game that I was playing with the Lord. And this is just what people do when they're immature spiritually. I was always told that no one can tell, or no one can know when Jesus is coming back, right? 
That's true, right? Matthew chapter 24. No one knows the day or the hour. Um, verse 42, verse 46. The Son of Man is coming as an hour that you do not expect. Um, so always be ready. So I would pray this little prayer. Lord, I know you're not coming back in the next five years. So, dot, dot, dot. See, I think if I could put a date on it, and I told him that he would not come back in the next five years, he would prove me wrong and come on back. Because I was ready. I hadn't gotten back out into sin into the world. And so I thought I could play this little game with him because that way I could be secure. That's not how it works. But there's another thing that I've thought about in my mind with regard to my kids. My kids, you see, when they were small, it was very easy for me to desire for the Lord to come back because I didn't want to lose them to the world. It scares me to death. I'm not going to lie to you. I've got really, I could go and preach to everybody in Lawrenceburg, or everyone in Cookville, or all over the world, and, and those people could all be baptized, but if my three children don't make it to heaven, I will feel like I'm a failure. That is your job. Just think if every man and woman would just be faithful to one another and help their kids get to heaven and make that the number one goal, what kind of world are we living in? That's what we want to do. So I remember before Luke came of age, thinking, Lord, please come back. Come back because I'm a Christian, my wife's a Christian, and if you come back, my children are safe. But I came across this idea. I changed my mind. Specifically about this one thing. Grace. You see, my children didn't know grace. And the reason why I fell in love with God was because of the grace that he offered me in spite of myself. And my children, as they get to spend time here on earth, and they see what sin can do to their life, and they see how it can destroy and they can see how it can manipulate. And, and they can see how it can devastate. And then they see a Savior hanging on the cross for them. And they fall in love with God. I want them to love God for the same reason that I do. And that's because Jesus died on the cross. So we have something to preach and we have something to teach to our children. But ultimately, we want what we preach and teach to resonate with them enough so that they'll go to heaven someday. Here's another one on heaven that blows my mind. Will we desire to be someplace else other than heaven? I've heard people say stuff like this. If they don't have this in heaven, I don't want to go. What's their favorite ho hobby? Uh, fishing or golf or, or, I don't know, shopping. <laughs> I don't know. what people. Uh, this is one specific thing that I like. You know, if I don't get to watch football in heaven. Uh, by the way, David, I was thinking about you guys coming and they've, they've been coming every year to go. It's usually UT Florida that you guys see that game, don't you? No? It's, well, it was this last year it was. But it, they don't always play, you know, in UT. But it's, it's a big game you guys come for. And then on the way back, they worship with us. And uh, I've thought, I need to make sure on that Sunday I preach an encouraging message. Because we've had some rough years lately. I mean, this is like... It's going to be okay. You know, that's what I need to preach about. We've had some rough years, but it's going to get better. And hey, I'm living over there, and we've got people with season tickets, so it's a big deal over there too. But, uh, you know, if there's not football in heaven, or Mark Twain said if there's not laughter in heaven, he didn't want to go. Well, I'll I just said to Mr. Twain, if there's joy, there's laughter. In heaven, no drooping or pining nor wishing for elsewhere to be. God's light is forever there shining. How beautiful heaven must be. You know, one of the reasons I want to go to heaven is not just for what is going to be there. It's for what's not going to be there. Did you read there in Revelation chapter 21 that murderers won't be there? Immoral people won't be there. Idolaters, liars, sorcerers, those people aren't going to be there. And you read a little bit later, in that chapter, verse 27, there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But listen, but only those whose names are written in the book of life. Again, are you a Christian? Is your name written in the book of life? Can you sing that song? I know, I know my name is there. You know, I, don't, I honestly don't know how people can even hit their pillow at night if they are not fully confident that heaven is going to be their home. And since we're talking about this, I think you're in one category or another. You're either a Christian who believes that you're saved, again, not by what you've done, but what, by what Jesus has done, or 
Well, I guess there are three categories. You're a Christian who is doubtful because there's a sin in your life that you don't repent of, something that you repeat constantly. You need to get that sin out of your life, and you need to stop doing whatever it is you're doing that is causing you to lose your relationship with the Lord. And then the third person would just be the person who's not a Christian, and they don't have any hope at all. But to desire it, to want it, and to realize that once we're there, we won't want to be anyplace else. I think that's what heaven's going to be like. Uh, here's another question people ask. Will we ever fall from heaven like Satan did? Will we lose our reward? You know, we read in the book of Revelation and that Satan fell like lightning from heaven. Now, that was, of course, before we believe there to be the earthly time in which sin was in the world. And, of course, Satan was already down into the world after the creation. But it talks about the fact that there's not going to be any temptations. There's not going to be any situations there that are going to cause us to sin. I just believe in that through the eye of faith. How about this question? Will we know one another in heaven? I've been asked that one a lot. There are entire books written on this subject. How can we recognize each other? Now, that second one, I don't know. But I do believe that we're going to know each other in heaven. My, my son would like this quote because it's a Yoda quote because he's a, a Star Wars nerd. But um, Yoda says, Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. And if you think about what he's saying is, it, this is not me. This is not Jeremiah. You can't really see Jeremiah. Jeremiah's on the inside. And I believe that about you. I know that you are who you are on the inside. And I'm always going to be Jeremiah, and you're always going to be you. In Luke chapter 16, Lazarus goes to the bosom of Abraham. Abraham is still Abraham. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus says, I'm the God, or he speaks about God being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thousands of years later, he's not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. So I think that we'll always be who we are. And if I know who I am, and if you know who you are, we'll have an eternity to bump into one another and get to know each other again in heaven. I want to finish with a couple of thoughts, and I thank you for, for being here with me today. I, I want to talk a little bit more about the longing for this place. Um, is it going to be worth it? Is it going to be worth it? Do you ever feel like as a Christian that everybody else out there is doing whatever they want to do and you are specifically doing differently than they are? And I, I want to specifically talk to you young people and thank you for being attentive. You've been here a long time today. But you're going to find in the next 10 or 15 years that the people that you're associated with now are going to take a different path than you. They're going to choose a different way to live. If you're going to be pure and if you're going to be holy, then you're going to have to reject a lot of the ideas that are being pressed upon you. And uh, we just had a, a graduation evening for our congregation where we honor the seniors. And this is the first time I've preached that lesson on a Sunday night for 20 years to graduates, but it was the first time my son was graduating, so it was a little bit different. It was a father-to-son message. This was his out-the-door message to my son from the pulpit. And, and one of the things that I... I wanted to impress upon him and upon all of those kids was what you're going to have to endure to be a Christian is going to be worth it. But you're going to have to stick to the stuff that you know. And that is homosexuality is a sin. I don't care what anybody says, but the practice of it is a sin and it'll never be right in the eyes of God. Abortion is murder. I don't care what anybody says, but it'll never be all right to take an unborn child out of the womb and put it to death. And I can go on with these things, but the Bible is always going to be authoritative. Christ is always going to be Lord. The church is always going to be the one church, even though everyone's going to tell you it doesn't matter what church you go to, they're lying. It matters that we're in the Lord's church, that we worship the way that he wants us to worship, that we live the way that he wants us to live. Jerry Jenkins used to say it this way, if you want to go to heaven, become a Christian like the Bible says, worship like the Bible says, live like the Bible says. Think about those three things as you go throughout your life. And when you see all the other people around you starting to take that other path, I'm going to tell you something. That is going to look attractive to you, but it is going to be disaster for them. It's going to be worth it. Everything that we sacrifice, we live a holier life. We stay away from the temptations of the world. We don't engage in the things that will make us popular or believable 
uh, all the time. And I'm so thankful that we have the church because we still have people that believe and think the way that we think. And so we need to, we need to stick together in those things. But I promise you that everything that you do one day is going to be worth it when it comes to heaven. And nothing that you do that's going to cause your soul to go to hell is going to be Long-winded preacher. <laughs> so let's finish with this. Yeah, I ran out of battery. Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us that by faith Moses, when he become of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the afflictions with the people of God rather than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, because, now listen to this, he looked to the reward. Homecoming. Homecoming for us is really all about heaven. And heaven is beyond my ability to express. But someone said it this way, Earth holds no treasures but perish with using, however precious they be, yet there's a country to which I am going. Heaven holds all to me. Out on the hills of that wonderful country, happy, contented, and free, loved ones are waiting and watching my coming. Heaven holds all to me. Why should I long for the world with its sorrows when in that home or the sea millions are singing the wonderful story? Heaven holds all to me. Heaven holds all to me. Brighter its glory will be. Joy without measure will be my treasure. Heaven holds all to me. When I read that, I realize that I really believe it. And that's enough for me. It's not even important, I guess, in the long scheme of things, if you believe it. It is for you, but for me, I believe that heaven is all that really matters. And if I think that way, it's going to change the way that I live. If I think that way, it's going to change the goals that I have for my life and how I decide to influence other people. And if I think that way, I believe that when I lay down at night, I have something that will always give me peace, no matter what's going on in this world. I think I have the best job in the world. I get to tell you about good news. And the good news is that Jesus died for your sins and that he has made heaven available to you. And I hope, I hope that one day Maybe somewhere in the future, in eternity, that we'll all be together and we might be able to say, I don't know, I don't think it's going to work this way, but you remember that time we had that homecoming at Leoma and we wondered, will we ever make it to heaven? And here we are. Wouldn't that be a great day? I hope to see you there. If you're not a Christian, become a Christian. If you need to come home, come home. We have promises that are, that are brighter than the best things that we can know. So let's look to God in faith and let's go to that heavenly country together. Once you come as together, we stand and as we sing. Oh.